Thank you, Karen. And thank you to all of you for being here and uh, everybody and everything that makes it possible for you to show up here at four o'clock on a Monday afternoon. I am delighted to have some time to think about reading storybooks with young children together. Um, when storybooks go well, um, there are a few things that are more delightful in a classroom. Um, when they don't go well, there are a few things that can be more painful. And so we want to think about what we do to support children in, as I put in the title, um, experiencing a powerful and an engaging read. And the idea with engaging is simply that when storybooks kind of light up for children, then um, then 20 minutes doesn't seem very long. And uh, one of the key things that we want children to develop, in fact, around reading stories is an interest in and engagement in and delight in books. And that's related to the powerful part. Um, also, I think we're going to take a look at how we use storybooks to build some um, key literacy skills, that they're a huge opportunity for us to help children make sense of books at this young age so that they will be able to make sense of them at later ages. Um, let's see, a couple of things, uh, housekeeping kinds of things or, or logistics maybe. One is that you should have received so I'm sure you received some handouts from Karen. You don't actually need any of them for today, um, but you you can have them for references if you wish. The, the first one is the PowerPoint, and for folks that like the PowerPoint, there you have that. The second one is a um, sort of a template for um, planning storybook reads, and I'm going to make use of some of the strategies that are outlined in that. You don't need that for this um, uh, this webinar, but you might find it useful later if you think the techniques are useful. Um, let's see, I want to pause here. Leanne says, are we supposed to be able to see Jonathan? Um, I should be showing up on one of your little screens. Um, and, uh, but in, in a bit, we will, you will have me on a larger screen when I do a storybook read. So um, if you don't see me well at that point, because I'm going to take it off a share, then we'll have a problem. But for right now, my voice is hopefully enough unless I show up on one of your little boxes. Um, other handouts that you have are, one is an, uh, a, a short um, essay that I and a colleague wrote for Boston Public Schools years ago um, that you may find useful on intentional children's book readings um, that's related to these techniques. And in addition, then um, the Reading Rockets series has um, done a um, uh, an essay on repeated interactive read alouds, which is the strategy we're using that you may find useful. So those are all available for you. Um, you are currently um, hopefully seeing me and hearing me. Um, I hope that we will also be hearing each other. And I want to invite you folks in to be sharing your background and experiences and um, knowledge of what we do with young children and storybooks along the way, because I'm one of a whole bunch of participants of 41 others today. So um, please share your knowledge as well. Let's um, take a pause just to get started and, and um, give you a moment to settle in. I don't know what your day has been like, but I'm guessing it's been filled with children and adults. And so take a moment to just settle in and, and give yourself a moment to be here. All right, so let me sort of situate this um, session in a, a series that we're doing here for the center. And I should say thanks to Karen and everybody at the center for making these all possible. This is the third of six webinars around early literacy. They, they stand independent of each other, but if you find this one useful, you may find others as well because we're sort of going through most of the key practices and skills for early literacy. Um, let's start by thinking about the books that you read. And I'd invite you to take a moment and 
Think about a book you've read recently that has delighted the children, maybe delighted you as well. That's a favorite. Maybe if you've been doing this a while, you're always glad when that book comes back around um, that we get to read that one again. Um, let's just hear some favorite titles from folks. You want to put some comments in the chat? Good Night Moon. There's a classic. Yeah. Chicka Chicka Boom Boom. Chicka Chicka Boom Boom. Okay. There's listen to that rhythm. Okay. What else do people enjoy reading? Marvin Gets Mad. I don't think I know that one. one oh, the snowy day. I do know that one. All right. Arnie the Donut and the Gingerbread Man. David goes to school. David has such a hard time. Pinkalicious. Uh, today. Wonderful. Pete the Cat. All right, there go. Oh, I'm missing a whole bunch here. An old lady, whistle for Willie, piggy, an elephant. All right. I don't know the perfect nest. If you, like me, are seeing books that you don't recognize, um, remember that at the end of our conversation, you can use the three dots down on the bottom to save the chat. Are you my mother? Ah, yes, there are lots of, um, uh, oh, the very hungry caterpillar. Old Lady, um, Piggy, and yeah, we've seen a couple mentions of Piggy and Gerald here, a couple mentions of David. Yeah. So um, let's see, Brown Bear, Brown Bear, and uh, the Gingerbread Girl. There's uh, perhaps somebody's done a genre study on gingerbread books, right? There are many of those that we can we can connect with. So when, oh, the kissing hand, when when I say favorite books, it's probably not hard for you to call many to mind. And some of those are ones we share. Um, I don't know my crayons talk, but I'm going to look it up. I'm also going to look up The Perfect Nest, which I don't know. But Pete the Cat is a favorite every time through. Oh, Kitchen Dance. Yeah. Um, and uh, my, I think, I, I don't know how many hundred times I have read one Piggy and Gerald book or another. I'm old enough that I have grandchildren and my own children were um, a little early for, for the Piggy and Gerald, but I think we've probably read all of them with my grandkids. So um, hopefully when I mention these, this ask this question and you think of those books, a couple things happen. One is titles come to mind easily. And the other is that you get some kind of a little warm glow that books that we enjoy and that children enjoy are one of the pleasures of working with young children. What I wanna do is think with you about how we can use those books as purposefully as possible without using any sense of that delight. Okay, that we continue to have children who are excited because here comes Pete the cat in those shoes again, right? But what I want to suggest is that storybooks are also a powerful avenue for building early literacy skills. And, and I want to be clear about, about what when I'm thinking about that, all right? Um, if you've been at any of the other sessions we've done, you probably know we've thought about sort of two different kinds of early literacy skills, skills that are related to learning the alphabet code and the, the um, uh, sounds that, that, um, that letters represent, um, such as alphabet knowledge, phonological awareness, print awareness. And then there's a second set of skills that are about understanding what it is that you're having read to you or that later on that you are reading. One is you just basically need to know what some of the words mean, right? If there's uh, if the word fierce is in a book and it's describing one of the characters, it's helpful to know what fierce means. So simply vocabulary is um, is is essential to children's success in um, storybook reading and later on in any other reading as well. Oral language, understanding the structures of language, how words are 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 put together to, to make ideas in um, sentences and paragraphs um, and um, being able to handle um, sentences of longer construction and so forth is absolutely essential um, to um, 
uh, understanding stories. Notice that both of those also, of course, are skills that children um, construct in their oral interactions with adults and others. And then finally, background knowledge. And in fact, a very strong predictor of whether a child will understand a story is whether they know something about the story topic. So if you read a story about princesses, as I'm going to do later with you, um, many children have a great deal of background knowledge about princesses, and that makes it a relatively lower lift. Okay, If, on the other hand, um, you're reading a story about something they might know nothing about, let's say a famous artist in France in the 19th century, then that's a much harder lift because they just don't have the background knowledge to make sense of it, and we have to offer more support. So early literacy skills um, are, are um, sort of the, 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 what we can construct out of reading with children. But what I want to offer to you is that the books that we read and how we read them vary depending on the particular characteristics of the book. Um, someone mentioned Chicka Chicka Boom Boom. That's a book that I've read with children. I imagine many of you have. It's a fun book. It's an engaging book, and it does a number of things well, but frankly, probably the thing it does best is support children in both learning the names of letters and playing around with some of the sounds as well. We're focusing on letters, and there is a whole genre of books that are alphabet books, and if you were at our our alphabet knowledge workshop earlier, um, you actually received a list of, I don't know, probably 50 or something that that uh, there are many books that who's, who can be used in many ways, but their greatest value is supporting children and learning the alphabet. We then have books like Brown Bear, Brown Bear. And Brown Bear, Brown Bear has a number of characteristics, but I wanna, wanna highlight about Brown Bear is that it is a predictable book. That is, we have brown bear, brown bear, what did you see? I saw a red bird looking at me. And I don't even have to tell you what the next page is going to say. You know it's going to say red bird, red bird, what did you see, right? The text is predictable. And so we can use that predictability to play around with concepts of print and with the sounds of the language, okay? Those kinds of books are superb. Um, rhyming books do um, have some of that same kind of predictability. Those books are superb for playing around with some of the characteristics of print and sound. And we also have information books. This one here on building a house. You can find information books on everything from javelinas to mountains to anything else that a child might be interested in. And those books accomplish a couple different, well, a variety of different things, but one of the keys is they build background knowledge in areas that children might not know much about otherwise. Those are all wonderful. Um, what I want to suggest is that those are all different from what I'm going to call storybooks, and I would suggest using them in ways that are different from how I'm going to suggest that we use storybooks. So let's think some about storybooks. Here are some examples, okay? Um, Octopus Stew has been one of my favorites the last few years. And if you haven't read it, it's an extremely suspenseful story about a child who's drawing a picture of an octopus. Grandma decides, oh, I'm gonna make octopus stew. She goes and gets an octopus, which comes out of the pot and attacks her. And the child, Ramsey, has to save her from the octopus. Or so it appears in the story. There's a surprise in that story. Okay. Those of you that have read Click Clack Moo, you know the plot there. That one's been around a while. These cows get a typewriter and they start making demands of the farmer. Who knew cows could type? But there they are asking for all kinds of cushy things for the barn. And then when they don't get them, they go on strike and the farmer's not getting his milk or the farmer's not getting the cow's milk. It's, it's their milk, actually, but, um, you know, labor unions and all that, right? In any case, in all of these books, there are characters that have sort of qualities of, of, of motivation and interest and purpose, and something happens in this story that needs to be resolved, okay? Let me use a, a sort of a classic story 
to outline that. The story of corduroy, which I'm guessing just about everybody knows because it's been around for 100 years and it's seemingly in every curriculum. But corduroy is the story of uh, a bear at a department store sitting on the shelf. Lisa comes by and says, oh, I'd love to have that bear. And mom says, we don't have enough money and he's lost his button. And corduroy is going, oh my gosh, look, I, you know, I need a wardrobe upgrade. And so he goes wandering around the department store, has all kinds of adventures, gets busted by the cops, put back on his shelf. And um, in the meantime, Lisa's been saving money, comes back and buys him. So there are at least three qualities of this book that I think stand out as far as being a story. One is there is a real problem and a plot. Okay, so here's Lisa wants this bear. She can't have him. Corduroy wants to go home with somebody. He can't, he can't get bought because you know, he's, he's um, not up to marketing standards there with the button, right? He's kind of shabby. So you know, there, um, how will this problem get resolved, all right? There are characters that have feelings. You can tell that Corduroy is a sad bear when Lisa doesn't take him. You can tell Lisa's a sad little girl when she doesn't get to take Corduroy home. And you can tell how delighted they are when they reunite. And, and you know, you can sort of wonder about them and their well-being. Just to make the uh, the point how that's different from in some other books, if you think of another classic bear in children's literature, the bear from Brown Bear, Brown Bear, okay? Nobody wonders how that bear is feeling or what that bear is thinking. Nobody thinks to themselves, oh my gosh, the, the red bird's looking at the brown bear. I wonder how the brown bear is feeling about that. I wonder what he's going to do in response. There's, there's none of that, okay? There's no character with motivations, feelings, experiences that make anything happen, okay? The other characteristic of stories, uh, um, of a rich story often, is that it has rich vocabulary. And we'll see that with a couple books that um, that we're going to look at. I'm gonna leave that for you, if you're somebody who reads Corduroy, to just go browse through that book sometime and notice all the words in that book that, three, four, five, even six-year-old children wouldn't necessarily know on their own. So um, with those qualities making a story, there are some things that stories can be really powerful for. One is comprehension. There's a problem to be figured out in a story. That means it might actually be hard to understand the story. No child has any difficulty understanding brown bear, brown bear. Okay. But some of these stories are actually more complex and involve some figuring out, some understanding. Why did the character do that? What might happen next? Okay, And while that makes the story in some ways more difficult to read, it also makes it more engaging. And if we can help children and understand it, more valuable. I already mentioned the, the vocabulary. And as I said, with this kind of dramatic plot, like what's gonna happen to this bear when he's wandering through the department store and here comes the police and so on, then there's something for children to bring their attention to. Um, if you've noticed when they're watching a Disney movie, they have no problem staying with, a, uh, with an exciting plot for a good long time. And we can do the same thing with the story. So um, all of those sort of um, language sides of, of um, of literacy development are, are key skills we can develop in um, uh, storybooks. As Deb says, the better the problem, the better the story. Absolutely. All right. So um, just to be clear, this all ties directly in with the um, um, Illinois um, early um, learning standards. So we want children to be interested in books. We want them to recognize key ideas and details. Okay. So Details, yes, key ideas. What makes something a key idea? Key idea is one that's important to understanding the characters and the plot, right? So can they actually function at that level of, hmm, that looks like an important idea. They can if we support them. Um, establishing personal connections with books. This is an interesting one. This, this relates um, both to comprehension and background knowledge. And um, it's obviously easier for kids to establish personal connections to books that they have some um, 
close connection with. If you're reading a story about a new baby and somebody in a family has a new baby, then they'll make those kinds of connections. Um, but this also has implications for the books we choose and helping children have some connections with books, um, depending on the children's um, own backgrounds. And then comp competence in oral communication is related closely to competence in book reading experiences and listening skills. So one common critique of using storybooks, such as the ones that I've mentioned, is that they're often seen as too hard for children to understand. I've purposely chosen two books here from um, uh, a... Uh, a preschool curriculum that maybe some of you are using, uh, the creative curriculum. It's probably the most widely used curriculum. And these are two books here that, at least in my work in classrooms, educators may choose to pass on. And when, um, when I talk with them about why, um, universally it's because uh, for various reasons, um, children, um, uh, uh, teachers think that children will have a hard time understanding these. And in fact, they do have a hard time understanding them. The, the girl who wore too much is set in, if I remember correctly, um, set in um, a historical time in Thailand, which um, neither that period of history nor that country is something that many of our children have strong background knowledge. Although <clears throat> if you have some Thai immigrants, that might be a different story for them. Um, a Chair for My Mother has some um, experiences in it that hopefully, frankly, are outside the experiences of, of your children. So these are hard books for children to understand. And here's the charge I wanna to put to us that we choose storybooks that are actually too hard for many of the children in our classroom to understand on their own. And then when we read them, we scaffold that book so that, that the children are able to understand stories that would otherwise be too hard. And in the process of that scaffolding, then they are learning to develop skills of language, comprehension, and building background knowledge that they wouldn't have otherwise. So yes, too hard. And as it says there um, in, in curricula, that's on purpose. And I wanna suggest that we make that same choice is to choose some books that, that um, are not necessarily an easy lift to read with kids and read them in ways that they can understand and engage with. So, what does that mean, read them in ways that they can understand and engage with? Well, the strategy, the sort of name for the, the strategy that I'm going to use for you that that is um, sort of, I think, um, state of the art still today in 2023, I think, about effective story reads with, with young kids is repeated interactive read-alouds. So unpack that a bit, read-alouds we know about. Um, interactive suggests back and forth that this, the, the children are involved in constructing the story. Um, but there's that word repeated also, all right? So we're gonna read it more than once. And um, the, the pattern I'm gonna show you is about three or four times. Different people do it different amounts. There's no magic number. Um, I wanna suggest that with regard to repeated interactive, that those two words interact <laughs> and, and like this that we're going to read the book a few times. And in the first reading, frankly, it's not going to be very interactive at all. I'm going to be doing the heavy lifting of helping children comprehend and build language. So the first reading, not really interactive, but the second reading much more so, and the third reading as well, uh, even more so. By the time kids are hearing a book for the third reading, they often can construct much of the story themselves. So. Um, Oops, let me bring that back. I, I did want to highlight that, um, oh, geez, I keep doing that, that um, who this is especially valuable for is children who actually may be most challenging, but challenged by understanding the stories, that when we are intentional about supporting children's understanding of the language and plot of a story, then that especially helps the kids who are um, having a harder time. So, I'm going to do a first read for you 
And I'm going to ask you to just observe it and um, see what you notice that I do that's effective. And you might especially look for what do I do to support comprehension? Because we've said that's a goal. Okay. What do I do to support vocabulary? Because we've said that's a goal. But perhaps key is what do I do to support children being engaged or interested? All right. And I think in order to help you see this, I think it's going to be most useful if I stop the share. I think that'll be the case, that if I do that, you are more likely to be able to catch my camera when I'm when I'm um, reading with you. So um, hold it here so you can see it. There we go. All right. So today, we are going to read a new story we've read, never read before. It's called The Paper Bag Princess, and it's about this girl right here. Her name is Elizabeth, and you might not be able to tell in this picture, but she is a princess. Let me show you in another picture. Sorry to interrupt. You're still sharing your screen so they can't oh. see you any bigger. <laughs> oh, okay. There we go. How's that? And then if everybody, if you want to choose view and then choose speaker, you'll see Jonathan Big instead of seeing him one of... 50, Thank you. 50 squares. Thanks, Karen. All right. So I'll start again. Today, we're going to read a new story called The Paper Bag Princess. And it's about this person right here. This girl's name is Elizabeth. And she doesn't really look like a princess in this picture so much, does she? But she is. Let me show you. Look in this picture here. Can you see her fancy, expensive dress? And there she has her crown on top. She is a princess. And if you look at that picture, do you see some hearts up above her? That's because she's in love. She's in love with Ronald. And he's a prince. And they're going to get married. Oh, I think she's pretty excited about that, isn't she? Because she's in love. And they're a princess and a prince. But she has a big problem. Did you notice? Do you know what that is? <gasps> yes, it's a dragon. Oh, do you know about dragons? What? Oh, yes, they breathe fire and they're mean and nasty. Sometimes I call dragons fierce because they're kind of scary and strong and powerful and dangerous. That dragon, do you know what it did? It came to Princess Elizabeth's castle and smashed her whole castle and it took Ronald away. So now he's gone. And so she has a big problem. How is she going to marry Ronald if the dragon took her, took Ronald away? I wonder what she's going to do. So let's read this story together and find out what Princess Elizabeth does when the dragon takes her prince and see if she can rescue him and get married. All right, here we go. The paper bag princess. Elizabeth was a beautiful princess. She lived in a castle and had expensive princess clothes. She was going to marry a prince named Ronald. Yeah, you can see those hearts and see those expensive clothes. A gown like that costs a lot of money, yeah. Oh, unfortunately, there was a bad day. A dragon smashed her castle, burned all her clothes with his fiery breath, and carried off Prince Ronald. So here comes that dragon. And do you see that there's all that smoke from his fiery breath? And oh, there's Prince Ronald. The dragon is carrying off Prince Ronald. Oh, no. And burned all her clothes? I think she's naked. That's going to be a problem too, isn't it? What's she going to do if she's naked? Oh, Elizabeth decided to chase the dragon. <gasps> that seems like a really dangerous thing to do because that dragon looked very fierce, didn't it? But she's going to chase that dragon and get Ronald back. Let's see if she can catch him. She looked everywhere for something to wear, but the only thing she could find that was not burnt was a paper bag. She put on the paper bag and followed the dragon. He was easy to follow because he left a trail that's like a path 
of burnt forests and horses' bones. <gasps> Those forests are burnt from the dragon's fire. Look at all these horses' bones. I wonder why there are horses' bones. I'm thinking maybe the dragon eats a whole horse? That is a very fierce and scary and dangerous dragon. Goodness. Finally, Elizabeth came to a cave, that's a hole in the ground, with a large door that had a huge knocker on it. She took hold of the knocker and banged on the door. Dragon stuck his nose out of the door and said, well, princess, oh, I love to eat princesses, but I've already eaten up the whole castle today. Oh, I'm a very busy dragon. Come back tomorrow. He slammed the door so fast that Elizabeth almost got her nose caught. So he just shut the door on Elizabeth. He's not going to let her in. Oh, goodness. I wonder how she's going to get Ronald now. Elizabeth grabbed the knocker and banged on the door again. She's very determined. See that big knocker? She's using that to bang, bang, bang on the door. The dragon stuck his nose out the door and said, go away. I love to eat princesses, but I have already eaten a whole castle today. I'm a very busy dragon. Come back tomorrow. Wait, shouted Elizabeth. Is it true that you are the smartest and fiercest dragon in the whole world? So fierce, that means he's dangerous and scary and strong. Oh, yes, said the dragon. Oh, look at this picture here. Do you see the dragon? The way he's holding his hand next to his mouth, he's holding it like this. Like sometimes when people are very proud of themselves, what they'll do after they've done something magnificent, they'll take their fingers and they'll go blow on them and wipe themselves and look at their fingers like that, like, oh, I did that thing and it was really easy. So he's saying, yes, I'm the smartest and fiercest. Mm, he seems very proud. Oops. Let's see here. Is it true, said Elizabeth, that you can burn up 10 forests with your fiery breath? Oh, yes, said the dragon. And he took a huge deep breath. Oh, oh I breathed out so much fire that he burnt up 50 forests. My, not just 10, but 50. Fantastic, said Elizabeth. That means like wonderful, terrific. And the dragon took another huge breath. Oh, oh I breathed out so much fire that he burnt up one. Hundred forests. Magnificent, said Elizabeth. And the dragon took another huge breath. <gasps> but this time, nothing came out. The dragon didn't even have enough fire left to cook a meatball. Oh, he just has a little puff of smoke there. So Elizabeth asked him to burn down forests, and he did. But then he used up all his fire. Hmm. Elizabeth said, Dragon, is it true that you can fly around the world in just 10 seconds? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Why, yes, said the dragon. And he jumped up and flew all the way around the world in 10 seconds. <laughs> he was very tired when he got back, but Elizabeth shouted, Fantastic! Do it again! So the dragon jumped up and flew around the world in just 20 seconds, when he got back, he was too tired to talk. And he lay down and went straight to sleep. So Elizabeth had him breathe his fire so that he used up all his fire and use his strength for going around the world. And he used up all his strength. And now he went straight to sleep. Oh, look at him there. He's sound asleep. Oh, boy, he still looks dangerous, though. I wonder what Elizabeth's going to do. Elizabeth whispered very softly, hey, dragon. The dragon didn't move at all. She lifted up the dragon's ear and put her head right inside. She shouted as loud as she could, hey, 
Holy dragon! The dragon was so tired, he didn't even move. He shouted right in his ear and he didn't even move. He must really be exhausted. Elizabeth walked right over the dragon and opened up the door to the cave. Oh, did you see who was in the cave? I forgot to show you. Look back there. Can you see who's up in the cave? There's Ronald, and now she's opening the door to the cave. And there was Did she save him? Oh, let's see. There was Prince Ronald. He looked at her and said, Elizabeth, you are a mess. It's not a very nice thing to say after she rescued him. You smell like ashes. That's the stuff from fires. It's kind of stinky. Your hair is all tangled. That means it's all messy. And you are wearing a dirty old paper bag. Come back here when you are dressed like a real princess. So Elizabeth rescued him, but he's telling her, you don't look like a princess. So I don't want to be with you. Ooh. Hmm. I wonder what Elizabeth's going to think of that. That's pretty hurtful and rude and disrespectful, isn't it? Ronald, said Elizabeth, your clothes are really pretty and your hair is very neat. You look like a real prince, but you are a bum. It's a person who's not pleasant or good. They didn't get married after all. Do you see Elizabeth dancing off into the sunset? <gasps> this book had a surprise ending for me. I'm wondering, I remember back at the beginning, remember Elizabeth was in love and she wanted to be with Prince Ronald. And then when the dragon took him away, she did all that work to rescue him, remember? And then, at the very end, after he talks to her, she says that she doesn't want to get married anymore. Wonder why she decided not to get married. Then we could have a little discussion about that. But let me just pause right there. And let's see. I think you've had enough of Jonathan at this point. Let's go back to some screen share and look at some ideas together. So I think I'd like to just invite you to share what you noticed that the reader did that was hopefully effective, oops, in keeping children engaged and building vocabulary and supporting comprehension. And um, if there's something you'd like to share in the chat or if you'd like to come off mute and share some things, what did you notice in that reading? Hopefully there were some things in there that were effective explaining and adding my own thoughts. Okay, absolutely. That's a key part of that. And the vocabulary, the animations, the voice, the vocabulary. Ah, discussing what the princess was wearing. Yes, that's part of sort of sharing my ideas, isn't it? Expl okay, so we've got lots of comments here about both vocabulary and support for comprehension. Yeah, okay. Specific questions to point the students into certain directions. Okay. And Leslie noticed hand movements too. You don't always have to define a word or explain something by telling about it. You can use your hands and pointing to parts of the pictures. Okay. And Carrie, I appreciate you saying explaining what some things mean that they may not know. That's a key part of this, isn't it? So what I'm seeing here is that that key idea that Carrie has of thinking about what children do not know and then using what all do we have? Hand movements, pointing to parts, asking questions, giving definitions, explaining, discussion, okay? Adding my own thoughts, animation, voice, a whole variety of strategies. Rising and lowering voice at interest points. Yeah, okay, so, so you folks are noticing so many strategies. That's awesome, terrific. Um, so let me see if I can, um, 
collect those in a way. And I think what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to jump around in the slides a bit because you folks did a whole bunch of, uh, of different things here. Um, I think the first thing I would highlight here is that you, I, you named really, I think, three different areas that I focused on, just as we'd said at the beginning. Vocabulary, what are we doing to support the words? Engagement, what are we doing to keep kids interested? And comprehension, what are we doing to help them understand? And engagement and comprehension are really closely linked because, frankly, if they don't understand, they check out, right? So comprehension is essential. So we're doing all of those things. And, and I want to note some things that you noticed, okay? And I'm going to actually jump ahead and come back, all right? And that is that with regard to words, the ways I supported the words, you folks really highlighted I think three different strategies that I tried to use. One is at some places pointing to the pictures. Okay, so um, let's see if I can, oh, pointing to the knocker. Okay, I didn't define a knocker, but I pointed to it, all right? Acting out using gestures. So um, if we're looking for, um, let's see if I can find, uh, oh, um, um, smashing, for example, I, I used my body for, for smashing um, or for, um, yeah, I think that's probably a good example or for um, when she banged on the door. So instead of um, defining those words, we can use our bodies or our voices, okay? Um, and then telling about the meaning as well, right? So some different strategies for defining words. And then you also described some different strategies for um, comprehension, okay? And I'll just highlight those. One is that expression is a really powerful tool for helping kids understand. So if, if I want to convey that Elizabeth is kind of buttering him up, I can just say, you know, I can use my voice for that, right? Is it true that you are the smartest and fiercest dragon in the whole world? And if we want to convey that the dragon is a little proud of himself, I can go, oh, yes, right? So using our expression, reading with expression, communicates comprehension meaning, helps us understand what's happening in the story, helps us understand how characters are feeling, right? The comprehension comments as well that you folks described. Um, and then finally using the illustration. So let's go back and look at some details. But really, you folks have named, I mean, we've got three strategies for comprehension and engagement and a few things at the beginning as well. And then three strategies for, for um, vocabulary. And let's unpack those a bit, all right? So what I'd like to do with you um, in order to get at that is to sort of go through some vocabulary and some comprehension challenges with a different book and have you folks, uh, have us all sort of think about that together. And the book I'm using is uh, this book, uh, Too Many Tamales uh, by Gary Soto, um, one that's been around for a while, um, part of a couple different curricula, which is why I chose it. Um, and, uh, well, and also because it's a pretty good storybook read and one that is challenging for children to understand. So first thing I want to suggest we can do when we're looking at a storybook and thinking about how we're going to support children in understanding it would be, let's pay some attention. We're going to pay attention to the vocabulary and the plot. And for simplicity's sake, let's start with the vocabulary, all right? So let's just take a look at this book. And as we read it, um, Notice words that children that you work with might need support in understanding. So let's take a look. Here's page one. Snow drifted through the streets, and now that it was dusk, tris Christmas trees glittered in the windows. See any words there that children in your classroom might benefit from some support with? Glittered. Dusk. Okay. Drifted. So we've got three words here at least. Drift, drifted, glittered, and dusk. All right. So I want to suggest um, a couple a couple questions for us to think about as we consider how we're going to support vocabulary for children. All right. The first is like you just did, I did identifying words that kids are that the children you are reading to would benefit from some support with. We found three right away, okay. Next thing is gonna be, 
which of those words do we give them support for, okay? And it may not be all of them, all right? We may need to make a decision because if we if we do too many words, we can bog down the story, all right? So you might decide that you're only going to um, support the word glittered. And then you'd need to think about how. Am I going to point to the illustration? I'm going to act it out, I'm going to define it. So let's take a look at some others. Maria moved, um, moved her nose off the glass and came back to the counter. She was acting grown up now, helping her mother make tamales. Their hands were sticky with masa. That's very good, her mother said. Maria happily kneaded the masa. She felt grown up wearing her mother's apron. Her mom had even let her wear lipstick and perfume. If only I could wear mom's ring, she thought to herself. Any words there you see that kids are going to oh, Tamales, masa, needed, perfume, lipstick. So there's a bunch. All right. And I will tell you, in terms of this story, two words that are going to be absolutely key will be masa, okay, because masa is going to have a prominent role in the story, all right, and kneading, because notice her hands down into that bowl. So we need to think about how are we going to help kids know those words? Maria's mother had placed her diamond ring on the kitchen counter. Maria loved that ring. She loved how it sparkled like her Christmas tree lights. When her mother left the kitchen to answer the telephone, Maria couldn't help herself. She wiped her hands on the apron and looked back at the door. Any words there? Sparkled. And sparkled is one that we could actually make an interesting connection back to glittered with, right? I'll wear the ring for just a minute, she said to herself. The ring sparkled on her thumb. So all the more important here that we introduce sparkle because it's showing up twice and it's capturing her attention, isn't it? All right. So um, let's just pause. Any thoughts about how you'd help a child know what the word sparkled means? Could you use that illustration and point out that it's shiny? Or maybe you could talk about sparkling as being shiny, or maybe there's something in your room that's sparkly that you could refer to. Model it. Absolutely. Yeah. If you have a sparkly ring, Okay, some of you probably are wearing sparkly rings. All right. Mama returned to kneading the masa. So let's pause on that word kneading. How would you help a child, help children know that word kneading? Oh, and Krista's making a connection with sparkle to the lights on the Christmas tree. Beautiful, yeah. So if we, especially if we talked about, if we'd highlighted that back on that first page, right? Okay. And we've got some help here for kneading. It's like mixing. So there's a nice definition. And Anne is making a connection to children's prior experience. That's a powerful way for kids to know about something. We can knead Play-Doh. We could model it. We could show a video. Yeah. I also might um, point to that bowl, right? Yeah, that she's putting her hands down in that bowl and she's pushing down. She's kneading it. Absolutely. So you can even de demonstrate. Go ahead. Yeah. You could tie it into even if they help their mom in the kitchen at home and have they ever made cookies or made bread or. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And and the opportunity there is some children do have background knowledge they can apply here. They may never have made tamales, but they've done other cooking where they've made some kind of dough. Right. And. You know, what I'm hearing, seeing a whole bunch of folks doing here is that you're thinking of activities outside of the book read as well, right? Okay, so um, um, doing some, having some materials and demonstrating. I want to be clear, during the story, and in fact, this is something we should check on, during the story, we don't want to pause for too long, because if we do then we lose kids, right? So we need some kind of a short, succinct way of doing it during the story, or else if we're gonna do some of those other experiences, we might do them before the story, and then we can make reference to it then. And, and I actually wanna highlight that this here at this point, that, that 
the story needs to keep moving. We can't have too many definitions for too long. Otherwise, it ends up feeling like a vocabulary quiz rather than a story. And so hopefully what you saw me model and that we would need to do reading this story is to tuck in definitions in short, quick kinds of ways, right? Tucking in information. Did we finish that? Oh, no, we didn't. Maria returned to kneading the masa, her hands pumping up and down. That might be an opportunity to model that kneading, right? Okay. Um, on her thumb, the ring disappeared, then reappeared in the sticky glob of dough. So I want to highlight in this story, that's a point where we're going to need want to make sure, because in case you don't know, what's going to happen is she's going to lose the ring, okay? So... Um, we need to be building towards that comprehension. Her mother returned and took the bowl from her. Go get your father for this part. Then the three of them began to spread masa onto corn husks. So sp spread is going to be another word here. Corn husks, probably another word. Yep. Teresa's just got it that we're going to make tamales together. <laughs> that, that would be a wonderful companion to this, wouldn't it? Absolutely. Maria's father helped by plopping a spoonful of meat into the center and folding the husks. Okay, so plopping and folding. Okay, he then placed them in a large pot on the stove. Here's something I want to highlight for you. Um, plopping is probably something that we can do with emotion, and folding is probably something we can do with emotion. And while we want to build those words, it's not crucial to understanding the story that kids understand plopping, all right? So we'll support it, but, you know, we don't have to spend, you know, a minute defining it. They made 24 tamales as the windows grew white with delicious smelling curls of steam. Okay, so let's, we'll, we'll take a look at vocabulary here, but we're gonna, we're building towards some comprehension challenges as well. A few hours later, the family came over with arms full of bright presents. Her grandparents, her uncle and aunt, her cousins, Dolores, Teresa, and Danny. Maria kissed everyone hello. Then she grabbed Dolores by the arm and took her upstairs to play with the other cousins tagging along after them. Possibly tagging along there. Would that be a phrase that not everyone is going to know? Yeah, okay. Oops. All right, here's our key comprehension moment. They cut out pictures from the newspapers of toys they were hoping were wrapped and sitting underneath the Christmas tree. You can tell this is an old book with newspapers, right? We might have to explain newspapers. As Maria was snipping out a picture of a pearl necklace, a shock spread through her body. Let me just pause right there. Any words that you're hearing? Let's see if we can name some of the words that kids are going to need some support with. As Maria was snipping out a picture of a pearl necklace, a shock spread through her body. Okay, Tammy's highlighting shock and, and snipping and possibly pearl necklace too, I'm thinking, right? And the reason I want to pause here is we've got probably three, three words, snipping, pearl necklace, and shock. And obviously any vocabulary is a gain for kids, but of those words, the one that matters most in this situation it's probably shock because that's the one that gives us comprehension information. Okay. It, I mean, frankly, Maria could have been snipping out a picture of a Lego kit. All right. And it wouldn't have mattered to the story. But what does matter is look at her face, right? A shock spread through her body. So we're going to need to explain shock. And, um, we could possibly point to the illustration here and look at her face. Oh, she looks shocked. Okay. We could act shocked ourselves and or we could give a little explanation. I want to mention with regard to explanations, definitions, um, like you and I, we kind of know what shocked means. But before I explain it to a child, I usually look it up. All right. Because it helps clarify my thinking. And actually something that's really useful to have is a children's dictionary. So you can look up words and get explanations that are designed for children. 
So um, I'd recommend having a children's dictionary. There are a number of good ones around. Um, can't think of the title of my favorite one. Maybe it's in here somewhere in this PowerPoint. I don't remember. Anyway, a, a shock spread through her body. Oh, and Krista's mentioning an, an emotions poster. Terrific for shock. Like, I mean, I have the word shock, but they may have, have surprised. Yeah. Oh, know. perfect. So yeah. That's a, yeah. Yeah. A surprise. There's a, there's a good definition. A, a big surprise. She's shocked. The ring, she screamed. Everyone stared at her. What ring? Dolores asked. Without answering, Maria ran to the kitchen. The steaming tamales lay piled on the platter. The ring is inside one of the tamales, she thought to herself. It must have come off when I was kneading the masa. So do you see now why it's so important for kids to get what's going on here and her fascination with the ring and the ring going in and out of, you know, um, disappeared, then reappeared. So she's thinking, and in fact, you'd need to offer that in an explanation, right? Okay. It must have come off when I was kneading the masa. Dolores, Teresa, and Danny skidded into the kitchen behind her. Skidded. They were sliding. They were running fast because everyone was worried. Help me, Maria cried. They looked at each other. Danny piped up first. What do you want us to do? Eat them, she said. If you bite something hard, tell me. So, um... We've gotten to a point that is sufficient for us to both have vocabulary and some comprehension. Let me just show you um, some examples of a teacher being purposeful about some vocabulary. Okay, so um, this is from oh gosh, what's the name? I stink. The the garbage truck book, right? And um, she's reading the page where the garbage truck is backing up to the barge. And let's just notice what she does to support that vocabulary. He's going to the river. Is he going to put all that garbage right in the water? Yeah. Hey, is that a good idea? No, I think he's putting it right inside that bin. Yeah, I think right there. Right inside there? Yeah. Oh, the light splash. The driver going reverse. Look how he's driving. He's going backwards. Reverse means to go backwards. Fly, because get me to the barge. And here my flash. So, Dallas, you were right. They're going to put the garbage on that. It's called a barge. A barge is a great big flat boat that they can put things on to carry it down the river. Right, so there she is supporting them with both reverse and barge. And um, now we get to rev. <gasps> Come on, give me some gas. Yes. Rev me to the max. Let's rev up that engine. Ready? <laughs> All right. So, uh, so essentially, what we've just seen here is you you know identify the words that you're that you're interested in supporting, and then doesn't matter what the words are. You've basically got three tools to help kids know what those words mean. One is to use something in the illustration. Okay, if you can point to down into her kneading into the bowl. Okay. You can act it out. You can act out being shocked or whatever. And then you can also tell the meaning of the word. And what I want to suggest with telling the meaning of the word is that that is the most time consuming of these. And I would save it for words um, where um, either you haven't had words for a while and you can easily slip it in, or it's a high value word in this book. All right. So I think Maria being shocked is is a high value word at that moment because you want to get she's going omg i lost my mom's ring okay and and so identifying the words that matter most and and putting time into those okay so actually let me just pause there comments questions confusion um issues points of interest with regard to supporting vocabulary anything that anyone would like to share or ask All right, then let's jump into um, thinking about supporting comprehension. And what I want to highlight here is that um, I think it's hard for us to understand how much children don't understand about stories that we're reading, how many inferences you and I make 
based on having read other stories, based on our background knowledge, um, and uh, based on interpreting things from the illustrations. And children often don't understand what's happening. I chose this Too Many Tamales books, both in part because I had had the experience and other teachers had too, of kids not getting what's happening with that ring, okay? And uh, Audrey, I'll come back to yours in just a minute, all right? Thanks, thanks for asking that question and I share your experience. Um, so let me just do a little bit with comprehension. We'll come back there. So, so kids often miss what's happening. They often miss attribute what characters are thinking and feeling. And remember how a character is feeling is often key to what happens next in the story. So it's important that, that kids get inside those characters because then they can get to that next one of why characters do what they do. This final idea here of how events are related in the story, causation, one thing causing another is central to what happens in stories, right? Maria is thinking, I lost my mom's ring. It is in the masa. My dad used the masa to make tamales. The ring is in the tamales. We need to eat all the tamales to find the ring. That whole causal chain is how you get from making tamale, making masa to the kids eating the family Christmas meal um, without the parents being around, all right? And I need to tell you that, you know, one of the things that we need to remember is young kids are just getting the idea of causation. That if you talk with a, like a, a two-year-old or even many three-year-olds, they still see one, one thing happening and then another thing happening and then another thing happening and then another thing happening. And they don't get that the first thing is related to the second. And that the second helped cause the third. And the third helped cause the fourth. And so helping kids understand causation is absolutely key to actually making a huge change in how children listen to stories between about ages three and six, getting causation. And so we're going to need to explain some of the causation to them. All right, I'm going to pause for just a second and return to um, vocabulary because Audrey raised a really key um, question, actually. She says, um, do you ever ask kids what a word means and have them answer? And Audrey says, it hasn't worked well for me in large groups so far, but I do it a lot for small groups. And um, Audrey, I don't know why it hasn't worked well for you. I would suggest that um, it hasn't worked well for any number of folks because if it's actually a challenging word, you often get a lot of mistaken information, okay? So um, uh, if you ask kids about horse's bones, um, they might um, uh, talk about dogs eating bones. If you talk about shock, they might, well, if they know anything about it at all, it might have to do with, you can't stick your finger in the electric in an electrical outlet or whatever, right? And and children often, when we ask them for definitions of challenging words, they often give incomplete and in fact mistaken definitions. And the problem is you got 16 other kids sitting there taking that information in. And once somebody tells you, let me just see if I can give an example here of something a kid might do. Okay, so, um, um, uh, meatball. And some kid says, meatballs, that's that movie where they, and then the kids all start talking about the movie Meatballs, okay? And um, that's entirely possible in a preschool classroom, right? And the problem now is everybody's thinking about that, and that's what gets lodged in their brain. And we know, actually, that once kids get an initial impression, it's hard to move it. And if, so, so rather than correcting or 
reinterpreting um, misimpressions, my suggestion would be that you provide the information. And then when you come back to the word the second time, you invite kids to provide information. And Lee is saying that before reading, Lee um, explains vocabulary beforehand. Absolutely. Then you've got some background knowledge and then you can invite them to use it later on. And but but you've given them the information first. OK, uh, so I, I, I think that there are, in fact, some curricula that ask us to ask kids what words mean. And the research on that is it's just not an effective practice unless you've already told them what the word means. OK, so. Um, yeah, enough on that. To go back to the comprehension then, uh, what I tried to do throughout that story was to support kids in understanding what's happening, how the characters are feeling, why the characters are doing what they're doing, and what the causal relations are. And, this, and, and that's essential because if they get it, then they'll stay with you. If they don't know what's happening, if there isn't a plot to follow, they check out. Okay, that's the reason I want to suggest to you the main reason children check out on stories and say they're boring is because they don't understand what's happening in the story. If you're following this, this story, it may seem boring unless you're going, oh my gosh, she lost her mom's ring. Holy moly, is she in trouble? What is she going to do, right? How could that not be dramatic? as long as you understand that that's what's happening, okay? That's the key, they need to understand. Um, so essentially what I wanna offer is there's three places that we can offer comprehension support. One is what we do before the reading and then what we do during and what we do after. And I wanna highlight what I did before. I don't know if you noticed when I was reading Paper Bag Princess, I did really three things. The first is that I talked about the main character, okay? We want kids to start having some sense of who that main character is because that helps them understand that character's feelings and motivations. So remember I said, this is Elizabeth. She's a princess, okay? She's going to get married to Ronald. She's all excited about that. See all those stars, those hearts, right? We then point towards the story's main problem, okay? Um, we want them to be able to follow the main issue in the story. So let's tell them what it is, okay? In this story, Elizabeth's going to marry Ronald, but remember that this dragon takes Ronald away. I wonder what she's going to do, which provides us a purpose for reading, okay? Then, yeah, as Deb says, if they care about the character, the problem's a problem. Thank you for that. Yeah, if they don't care about the character, then it doesn't matter so much. But if this is a character that they're invested in, like, oh my gosh, she's going to get married and she lost her prince. Oh my gosh, right? Let's find out about this. So that's how we set up the story. I want to be clear about what I also didn't do. I'm not going to arrest you for it if you do, all right? But I did not spend a bunch of time talking about this is the front, and this is the back, and this is the spine. And what does the author do? And what does the illustrator do? Okay, I'm not saying you should never do that. I want to suggest, though, that if it takes more than three or four books for kids to know what the front and the back and the spine are, the concepts are too hard. And so we don't need to do it 100 times during the school year. And I want to encourage you to think about what's most important in this story. The most important thing in this story is that the children understand it and be engaged in it. So when I start the book, I'm going to put my heavy duty energy into helping them understand it. Okay. If you want to talk about the other stuff, fine, but focus on comprehension because that's what makes the book go. All right. So during the reading, then, I think you folks named everything I did. I, I tried to read with expression because reading with expression isn't just entertaining. It takes children into the meaning of the story, right? When, as, as I said, when Elizabeth is going, fantastic, she's, you know, she's puffing up that dragon, right? And when the dragon's going, oh, go away. I love to eat princess, but I've already eaten a whole castle today, right? He's proud. He's arrogant, right? 
right? So we're taking, when you read with expression, there you're giving comprehension information, all right? And then we, I made comprehension comments along the way, right? I talked some about, uh, well, in fact, at one point, what I did, if I remember right, was I went back and highlighted how she gotten the dragon to use up all his fire and warn him out. Okay, we actually went back and did a little summary of, of what she'd had him do. Um, and I highlighted that Ronald was up in the tower. So, so you can, you can um, use the illustrations and make your own comments to help children get what's happening in the story. Um, uh, let's see. So reading with expression. Um, that's, uh, you know, um, uh, hopefully that's something we practice, but I want to, in, in, it's actually, I mean, it is actually a skill, right? And so if you look at what your tools are for that skill, I mean, here's what you've got. You've got your voice, which you can raise or lower or make mean or make friendly. You can change your tone of voice, right? You can use gestures, right? You can, they're zooming across the sky or whatever that might be. You can use your body. You can, like, I leaned in, hey, dragon, right? You can use your face to look scared or mean or arrogant. And you can pick up the pace or slow the pace, okay? So hopefully something I did when Elizabeth was whispering was I slowed it. Elizabeth whispered very softly, hey, dragon, right? Which creates some drama, right? So those are your tools. And I'd encourage you to practice. Um, let's just take a moment to do a little practice. And um, let me offer you this page here. This is the next page after um, Maria has asked everybody to eat all the tamales. Here's what, here's, here's what the text says. Nothing. Didn't any of you bite something hard? Maria asked. What might Maria's voice sound like at that point? Anybody want to offer a comment or maybe even model for us? What might Maria sound like there? What's she feel? Panicked. Panicked. Ooh. Didn't anybody bite something hard? Maybe both shocked and surprised, okay? Yeah, Danny frowned. Now, how's Danny going to sound here? I think I swallowed something hard. What might his voice sound like? And then if Maria was panicked and shocked and surprised before, after Danny says, I think I swallowed something hard, She's going to be doubly panicked, shocked, shocked, and surprised. So we've got Danny feeling sheepish and worried. And then Maria swallowed it. Now she's maybe overwhelmed, right? Maria cried, her eyes big with worry. She looked inside his mouth, right? So this might sound something like, didn't any of you bite something hard? Danny frowned. I think I swallowed something hard. Is that sheepish, Claudine? Maybe, okay. Swallowed it. Okay. And what I just want to encourage you to do is, you know, pause and think about those characters and how they're feeling and what they would, you know, what that voice would sound like. And with young kids, don't be afraid of overacting. <laughs> I've never had one yet say, you're too dramatic, right? So if your first inclination is to go, swallowed it, go ahead and go, swallowed it, right? Fill it up, right? So um, practicing um, that expression, I would encourage you. And in fact, you know, before I read this book to you, I went to some of the pages where I thought the expression was most important. And I did like, I practiced my expression on this page here. No, not this page. Yeah, yeah, for how she'd say, hey, dragon. And I practiced my Ronald voice here as well because I wanted Ronald to sound like a jerk, frankly. <laughs> so how can he sound like a jerk? Um, 
And so I would encourage you, like we've practiced our vocabulary, go ahead and practice reading with expression. Identify the places in the story where you want to um, make comprehension comments, all right? And I think we've already looked at several of the ways that that can happen. Um, one of the things we can do is we can summarize. So I did go back and summarize at one point here where we said, I'm remembering that she helped the, uh, made the dragon lose all his fire. And then she made him get so exhausted that now he's asleep. So we can go back and see patterns, okay? We can explain things. Um, think alouds is an interesting idea. I think at one moment, let's see where I, where did I do a think aloud? Um, do I have an example here? Let's see. Yeah, no, I'm not. I guess I see if I can find one here if I remember. Um, Yes, I'm not recalling where I did a think aloud, but the idea with the think aloud is that you you might say to the children, oh, I'm thinking, well, in fact, here's something I didn't do, but you might if you decided that we wanted to give that much support. You might say, oh, I'm thinking that Elizabeth is trying to trick this dragon by getting it to be so tired. Okay, Now, I chose to not give that level of support, but you certainly could, all right? Um. And then asking questions. I'm wondering, like, I wonder what Elizabeth's going to do to, um, to keep herself safe from that fierce dragon that can even eat horses. That's pretty scary. So we can offer comments um, along the way. Um, so in this situation here, you know, what is Maria thinking when she says the ring? How would we help children understand what's going on here? Okay. The ring, she screamed. Everyone stared at her. What ring, Dolores asked. Without answering, Maria ran to the kitchen. Okay. We might go back to in this story and say, I mean, here, here would be a summarizer. Okay. To go back and say, I'm remembering that Maria was kneading the masa and she picked up her mom's ring. And then she went back to kneading the masa, and now the ring's gone. And she's thinking, oh, where is the ring? Is it back in the kitchen? So that would be a summarize, okay? Or you might simply explain. You might say, oh, Maria's realizing that she was wearing the ring, and now she's not, and she doesn't know where it is. Oh, my goodness, okay? So you can choose the strategy that you think is most effective there. The last thing I want to highlight for comprehension is that after the story, what can we do to support kids going deeper? All right. And what I want to suggest here is that we ask a question that involves them needing to do some thinking and figuring out. If you remember the question I asked in, in for for paper bag princess was about um, why she decided not to marry Ronald. Well, that's kind of a key question for the whole story, right? If kids have been following the story, I mean, what's your answer for that? Okay, you were following the story. We know that she was in love. She went and rescued him. When she rescued him, he totally dissed her. He was mean, yeah, yeah, he was mean. And he was mean about like her socioeconomic status or something. I don't know what you call being a princess, right? He was he was mean, he was disrespectful. And um, she decided that even if he was a prince, he was a snob, that's the word. Thank you, Le Leanne, he was a snob, yeah. And, and so um, uh, we can, invite children to think about that question. And if, and I wanna be clear, you and I can make that inference, he was a snob, but we might need to help children make that inference. We might need to do something like this, okay? So Elizabeth was in love with Ronald. The dragon stole Ronald. She went and rescued him. 
when she rescued him, how do you think, like, she worked really hard to rescue him, right? She chased the dragon. She was very brave around a scary dragon. And did he say, thank you for rescuing me? No. What did he do? He noticed that she didn't have on nice clothes and that her hair was messy. How do you think that made her feel? Yeah. Would you want to marry someone who doesn't notice that you helped them, that just notices your clothes? So you might need to support them in that comprehension. But we can do that. All right. Um, the key here is to find areas of the story that are central to the problem of the story and invite children to figure them out. You're asking challenging questions. All right. So now here, here's an example from um, Too Many Tamales. Why did she run to the kitchen? Because she, okay. And why did she tell the cousins to eat them? Now, I want to be clear. The story does not say why Maria ran to the kitchen. The story does not say why Maria told her cousins to eat them. Those are all inferences that skilled readers make. You have no problem making those inferences. Kids do. And so we end up unpacking and discussing those with them. Anybody here use creative curriculum? I want to highlight that the process that we just used of repeated interactive read-alouds that's the process used. This is, this is the set of strategies that's been adopted by the creative curriculum. If you look at those um, book discussion cards, they use a repeated interactive read aloud that's um, curriculum structure. So what I've just modeled for you is the process they use. Now, you know, if you pull out their card, in fact, there is a card for Paper Bag Princess. And you'll see that I didn't do exactly the same things that they did, okay? But here's what I did do. I supported comprehension and how I introduced the book, how I read it and the question I asked at the end. I supported engagement in the same way and I was intentional about my vocabulary. That's the key thing, not that you do it exactly the same way they say to. In the materials that I shared with you, you'll see that I think I highlighted earlier, there is a, um, a, a, a template for creating your own reading plan if you choose to. You can use these kinds of strategies with any good storybook, okay? Analyze the story, figure out what the children need, and make a reading plan. Um, actually, I want to highlight back here, the reason that Creative Curriculum uses repeated interactive read aloud strategies is because the two main researchers and developers of those strategies were a woman named Judy Schickedance from Boston and Leah McGee from Ohio State. Leah McGee is the lead author on the Creative Curriculum book studies. So in fact, when you see um, materials on repeated interactive read alouds, Leah McGee, Ohio State, that's why. This is the structure that I provided you for the handout on the first reads. Um, if we had another hour, I'd do second and third reads with you. I'd encourage you to look at the materials for more discussion of second and third reads. I'm going to have to leave that with you. But the essential idea with the second and third reads was while in the first read, I'm doing all the heavy lifting, I'm supporting the vocabulary, I'm scaffolding the comprehension. In the second and third reads, children now have lots of information and we can be inviting them to, we can be asking them questions about the story, inviting them to recall parts of the story and discuss parts of the story. We can ask them inferential questions about how the characters are feeling. So in a second read, the main thing I would do was ask, it would be to ask children to recall the story. And then on the third read, we can make some inferences, okay? Recalling is simply sharing information back. Um, inferences are taking that information and doing something new with it. Um, and you'll see in um, the Reading Rockets and in the essay that I shared with you that I wrote with Ellen Edmonds, both of those discuss second and third reads. Um, if anybody wins the, the book today um, the, uh, from um, Karen, um, that has lovely explanations of second and third reads as well. And in fact, the two main sources that I would share with you um, for um, 
uh, repeated interactive read-alouds are the Reading Rockets essay that I um, sent in the handouts and the book, So Much More Than the ABCs by Judy Schickadance and Molly Collins. Both of those are superb on um, storybooks. So um, we have like three minutes to do something we could take another hour on. Um, I would encourage you to be intentional about the books you choose from two perspectives. One of them is one that we've mentioned, which is choosing books that are challenging for children. And the other is about choosing books um, that both um, represent the children that you're working with and stretch the children that you're working with as well. We want children to see themselves in storybooks. And so we wanna choose books from um, 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 cultural backgrounds um, and language backgrounds that um, uh, represent children in our classrooms. But we also, of course, want to take children in books to places they've never been before. Um, so the idea of mirrors, of course, and windows. Um, we know that the diversity in children's books is um, still an issue, but there are many, many fine titles out there. And so I wanna actually just, I'm gonna skip this for now and, and pause on this and invite us to share uh, if, if there are some books that you have found that have been especially useful in connecting with some of the backgrounds of some of the children that you're working with. And um, I, this is a moment here for us to maybe share some titles um, other than perhaps some of the usual ones that have been in the, um, you know, in the um, curriculum for um, any number of years. Um, Paper Bag Princess, we probably don't have a whole lot of kids coming from princess backgrounds. The Leaf Thief, I don't know that book. Thanks for that, that title, Sandra. Um, any other titles that anyone wants to share? I will highlight Octopus Stew um, yet again. Um, I will also, let's see, other ones off the top of my head. Um, the Jabari books are, are wonderful books as well. Jabari Jumps is, I think, one I referenced. Um, I think that's handy here. I'm gonna grab um, there are a number of books. Um, oh, Luli in the language of tea. Um, there are a number of books um, from uh, some uh, Native American First Nations traditions um, published by the publisher Thetis. They are not contemporary showing how Native children live now, Native families live now, but do capture a number of the stories that different um, tribes tell. This one, The Girl and the Wolf, is one I especially like. Um, and Thetis Publishers has um, a, a number of titles like that. Wheels on the Tuk Tuk. Thank you, Karen. All right. Other, any other books? We'll, we'll give space for people to put in the chat. Um, but we want children to see their families and their cultures following the drinking gourd. All right. Thank you, Tammy. All right. Um, Let's see. Oh, here are a couple other titles. Um, Hairs, um, Saturday, My Heart Feels with Happiness. Um, so there are many titles out there and there are some wonderful book lists. I'm sure that uh, hopefully we're, we're connected to many of those. So let me just pause here. We've got like two minutes left. And I'd encourage you, you know, we've been thinking about choosing storybooks that are challenging, support, being intentional about supporting children being engaged, understanding and building vocabularies. Oh, Leslie, I love We Are Water Protectors. Thank you for that title. Um, some children and families can connect with that very personally, especially here in the Midwest. Um, and But thinking about um, your strengths in reading storybooks and what something you're carrying away is, this might be an opportunity for you to think about how would you like to use something from today? And um, I'd encourage you to jot something down to use it. And if anyone has any comments they want to put in the chat about something they're holding on to, something that seems important about our work here, I'll invite those. I'll give you a moment on that. And then in case you're not sure, um, how to do that, I'll remind you that if you if there are things here in the chat you want to save, if you go down to the bottom of the chat where those three dots are and you hover over it with your mouse, it'll say more. And if you click on that, you can save the chat. 
Okay. And Leslie, really looking at vocabulary and picking out the most important. Encouraging comprehension. Chris, I appreciate that word intentional. That I mean, I think that's that's at the heart of this, right? And then we have lots of strategies for that. Yeah. Thank you. Lisa's holding on to about um, about um, in giving the word um, information, setting the book up before reading. Yeah, thanks. Intentional with vocabulary, background on the book prior to reading, set, setting the stage. Thank you. That's a lovely way to frame that, Christina, a little sort of poetic there. Um, I'm seeing that it's 5.30 and um, I want to um, respect people's time. So uh, time for me to pause and Karen, 